I'm turning to the Colossian letter for a study this morning. The city of Colossae was nearby the city of Laodicea. When Paul wrote the, to the church at Colossae, Laodicea was still in existence as a congregation. Shortly after this, the earthquakes began to hit that Jesus had prophesied in Matthew chapter 24. Those earthquakes that became so severe immediately before the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. During that time, the city of Colossae and the greater part of Laodicea was destroyed. Colossae was not rebuilt, but the people moved on into the community or the area of Laodicea and rebuilt in that location. Therefore, in the book of Revelation, when you have the letters to the seven churches of Asia, you have one to Laodicea, but not to Colossae. And here in the Colossian letter, Paul mentions the Laodiceans in the first verse of the second chapter and speaks of the concern that he has for the church, that he has indeed been in a great conflict for them and for them at Laodicea. He is concern <clears throat> concerned with the people and their well-being. He is concerned with their spiritual welfare. He is concerned with all things that deal with their livelihood and is writing them in the Colossian letter now, remembering that this is before the destruction of the city and the earthquakes, and is encouraging them regarding the beauty of Christ and the power of their relationship to him in the church. The language is full. The sentences are long in this epistle, and each word nearly is a study and a sermon within itself. It is rich with the information of the beauty of Christ and the beauty of the church. We want to note some of that in our study just now. In the first chapter, verse 2, he says that it is to the saints, faithful brethren at Colossae, those saints are those that have been sanctified in the blood of Christ, set apart by the forgiveness of their sins, cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. And he speaks of them in the most enduring terms possible. In verse 4, he says that he had heard of their faith and since that time has been concerned with them and filled with hope about them. In verse Eight, he speaks also of Epaphras who has conveyed unto Paul the great love in the spirit that the Colossians had for Christ and the church, for the apostle who brought that truth to them. And he said, for this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, did not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye may walk worthy of the Lord unto all blessing or pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. Consider the Christian. Consider their responsibilities and their blessings. They are to walk worthy of the Lord, verse 10, unto all pleasing. They are to be fruitful in every good work. They are to increase in the knowledge of God. They will be blessed with strength in all might. It will be according to his glorious power, and it will be unto patience and long-suffering 
with joyfulness, and they will therefore give thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. God the Father has made us meet to be worthy as partakers of that inheritance of everlasting salvation in the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. We are elect people. Been made meet means that we have been made worthy. Of ourselves we were not worthy, by ourselves we could not create that worthiness, but by the blood of the Lamb in the forgiveness of our sins, He hath made us meet to be the partakers with the Son in the inheritance of the saints in life. What a grand statement. What a majestic place the Christian has in Christ Jesus. What a noble calling each of us have regarding the duties of our talents being used to his name's honor and glory. We are an elect people. Then it speaks of the Christ who made us such. In whom, verse 14, Christ, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Then we go to chapter 2. And Paul says, I'm telling you these things in verse 3, about all of the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Christ, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All right, I've laid the base to establish what Paul now sets down in principle in the first chapter in verse 19 that it pleased the Father that in him, Christ, should all fullness dwell. Now in chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, he develops that Christian system one step further and states openly that in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The fullness of first chapter and verse 19 in regard of Christ is that fullness of Colossians 2 and verse 9. The fullness is that in him dwelleth the Godhead bodily. That is whatever is true of God and of the Holy Spirit and of the Son of God is now manifest in Jesus the Christ. But we must not stop there. 
that establishes his deity, that establishes that indeed he was before all things, and by him all things have been created, and all that has been created is for him. Not only has this world been created for him, not only has the realm of nature been created by him and for him, but it is essential that we see Paul is driving the argument toward the point that the church, the new creation, as he calls it in Ephesians, the second chapter, has been created by him and for him. And the grand blessing of the Christian man and the Christian woman is that when we are in Christ, we are now, Colossians 2 and verse 10, complete in him. Therefore, the fullness that is in him now becomes the fullness that is in us. We are made complete in him as a mind, physically, socially, temporally. I am not complete as a soul in Christ. I am complete. The fullness is in him. He is head over all principalities and power. Therefore, he is head over all things to the church, Colossians 1 and 18 and Colossians 2 and 11. And for that reason, his power is absolute, his authority is sovereign, and his headship is without peer and without competition. Therefore, it is to him that I bow and to him alone, for it is in him only that I am made full or made complete. How is it that we are made complete in Christ? We are inadequate in this world. We are inadequate, as we said, physical beings, social beings, political beings, civil beings, whatever relationship we might know or enjoy or succeed at in this world, we are yet inadequate. We are yet incomplete. But in him and spiritually, we are full. We are complete, made whole, perfect. Verse 11. It is because that ye have been circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. A spiritual circumcision made without hands. The faith of the operation of God, he will call it momentarily, in which there is a putting away or putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. It is with the flesh that we sin. The consequence and the guilt of sin befalls the soul. But when that it is that one is baptized into Christ, the faith of the operation of God cuts away the sins of the flesh. Cuts away the sins of the flesh, making us whole making us complete, making us full in Christ by saving us from our sin, by remitting us of our sins. So ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now he'll tell us what that is or how that is done. It is a spiritual matter not physical, and it is this, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. We are told in the epistles of Peter, the first epistle of Peter, that when we wrestle with the subject of sin and God and our relationship unto God, it is essential that we come to the understanding that sin is a warrior or an instrument of war spiritually that will destroy the soul in eternal death. And we are in a battle and we must wrestle with Satan, we must wrestle with sin, and we are at a war with ourselves. 
that the inner man, our own spirit, is at war with our flesh. And when we come to grips with that battle and win that battle through repentance toward God, then it is that we turn our attitude away from saying, I will not obey God, to that of saying, I will obey God. And we begin abandoning sin. And we've won that battle for the moment. We must continue to meet it. But we've won it for the moment. And then when we come to him in baptism, he makes us whole by cutting away the body of sins in the flesh. We see sin accomplished in the flesh, beginning in the flesh, and conducted by the flesh. But the guilt of sin is on the soul. It goes deep into the heart. It is not merely a fleshly matter. If sin were merely a fleshly matter in its guilt and in its consequences, there would be no need of salvation. For the flesh would simply die, return to the dust from whence it came, and all would be ended. But inasmuch as sin attaches in its guilt to the soul, something has to be done, for the soul lives eternally. And if it lives in sin, it will live eternally separated from God, which the Bible terms second death. So he says when we are buried with him in baptism, we are therein, in that act of being buried with him in baptism, also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. When we were baptized, we were baptized into Christ. When we were baptized into Christ, we came into that fullness which he represents. We are made complete. It seems that a casual study of these verses would cause people to understand the necessity of baptism to the remission of sins. And yet the world at large, the religious world at large, holds baptism in contempt, saying that it is not essential to the remission of sins, has nothing to do with the remission of sins, and that the believer is given an either-or option. He can either be baptized or not, and yet remain in fellowship with God. Paul is saying there's something far more vital to baptism than that. It is not a mere exercise. It is not a mere illustration. It is not a mere symbol. It is not merely the washing of the flesh, Peter says, to take away the filth of the flesh, <clears throat> rather that it is the answer of a good conscience before God, that it is in this act that we are coming into Christ, we are buried with him in the waters of baptism, and we are risen with him. This is where the fellowship with Christ and in Christ begins. This is the begotting of a new life. This is the birthing of a new life, of a new creature in Christ, free from sin, filled with hope, given that which is the very goal of everlasting or eternal life in the glory of God. He can see the Lord seated at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. He is setting his heart and his treasure there, and therefore he is going to bring himself into glory through his loyalty to the Lord. Notice the privilege and the blessing of new birth. Colossians 2 and 13. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You were dead in sin, dead to God, dead eternally, hopeless. He hath quickened you, made you alive again, enlivened you, 
invigorated you, gave unto you spiritual life and hope together with him. Together is participation, fellowship. You are in him, related to him, in association with him. And he has forgiven you. To forgive is to send away. To send away. That's why the scapegoat was used in the Old Testament as the symbol of New Testament forgiveness. The priest would lay his hands on the head of the scapegoat at the given time under the ceremony of the law, and that was to show the transfer of the sins of Israel to the scapegoat, and he would be led off into the wilderness, sent away forever. Forgiveness. Sins are gone. All trespasses. Every one of them. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Took away even the law, for the law was not able of remitting or forgiving mine sins. This has to come in Christ. Therefore the law was removed, and in its place is established the gospel of Jesus Christ, the blood of the cross, the means of the very salvation of man by the grace of God. And therefore, having spoiled principalities and powers, made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in that, and therefore let no man judge you in respect of meat or drink, let no man judge you in light of the law, those things which are a shadow of the gospel to come, let no man beguile you, stand in Christ. Let no man deceive you, let no man seduce you, let no man beguile you, let no man lead you away from the Lord Jesus Christ, stand in him, in the gospel, and therefore do not return to the law. Do not return to a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, Colossians 2 and 18. Do not begin to intrude in those things which you have not seen. That is, hear the Lord. Don't speculate. Don't imagine. Don't invent. Don't devise your own theories of religion. Don't become fanatically zealous in man's way. Hear the Lord. Remember, and unto him has been given the privilege of being head over all things to the church. In him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Therefore, hear him. Because he says in verse 19, if you are beguiled and you hear the word of mine and you walk in a voluntary worship of angels or some such thing as that, you are not holding the head. Christ. And if we are severed from the head, cannot live we do not live not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bonds having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God therefore if I would be full in Christ complete in Christ I must remain within that body joined to the head and thereby the body through the joints and the bands that tie it together and hold it together drawing its knowledge from the head drawing its nourishment from the head then there is a ministering of that nourishment throughout the body knitting it together knitting that body together and it increaseth with the increase of God the increase of the church, the growth of the church, spiritual and numerical, in maturity and in numbers, is in direct relation to its knit togetherness and thereby being increased by God. It is knit together, the increases of God. Now men will seduce us we got to backtrack to find how they do it to verse 8 in the second chapter of Colossians. 
But men will seduce us away from these principles of integrity and spirituality and growth through, what he says, philosophy, vain deceit, traditions of men, rudiments of the world. <clears throat> four, <clears throat> four avenues through which they make their approach of seduction. Philosophy, vain deceit, traditions of men, rudiments of the world. Philosophy is an unbounded love for knowledge, which leads to the point of criticism in Colossians 2 and 8 that they are now hinging their livelihood spiritually on physical, human knowledge, that philosophy, rather than divine knowledge the philosophy that is born of God. There isn't anything wrong with being a lover of knowledge. In the first chapter of Philippians, Paul and John, that a love, in order for it to be a growing thing, must be love of and love in knowledge. That we must both love knowledge and love then the knowledge that is of God. So knowledge within itself is not a terrible thing at all. We need to know and we must know more and more and more and love drives us toward the greater abundance of knowledge in God and in Christ. So philosophy as a lover of knowledge within itself is not wrong, but the contrast here is between the knowledge that is born of the imagination of men and the knowledge that is revealed of the divine mind of God. That is the contrast. And here it is, the knowledge of men will lead us away. Therefore, grow in knowledge, but let the superior knowledge be that of God. Let the fountain of knowledge be God Almighty and not man. Let us be learners of God and not teachers against God. Then there will be vain deceit. They will deceive us, deceive us through vanity. Vanity is emptiness, but we are teased by the things of emptiness. We are teased by the pleasures of this world. We are teased by the vanities of the natural life in which we find ourselves existing day by day. And therefore we have to be aware of the deceptiveness of that and the tradition of men. Not the revelation of God, the tradition of men. We're putting our stock in men and not in God. We're putting our stock in what men have been and done rather than what God has revealed or said. So that will lead us astray. And then the rudiments of the world. The speculations as to how God created or whether God created the world. We can get so caught up on where we came from that we never pay any attention to who we are or where we're going. And where we came from is such a matter of fact and past fact that we cannot alter it. There isn't any change that we can bring about if we knew all about the creation of man. If we understood precisely how it was done in the hand of God, this would not bring us one step closer to the question of salvation. So we simply lump it up this way. God is God and God is creator and we have come from him. We are his creation. He's given us a soul made in his image. That soul is eternal and therefore accountable unto God and has either life or death held before it. And in God and in Christ, that soul shall live eternally in the glories of heaven. But in the meantime, we have to get rid of our sins to be full in Christ, to be complete in Christ. We must in our faith of him as the Lord, repent toward God that we will become obedient to the blood of the cross by being buried with Christ in baptism that he might rid us of our sins in forgiveness, that he will remove every trespass, every sin, that we might walk with him eternally on that grand and glorious shore. Are you complete in Christ? Have you obeyed the gospel? Are you a newborn child of God? 
are you a Christian? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Will you come? May we encourage you. May we pray for you. Will you come to Jesus while we stand, while we sing?